This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. Declare the meeting um, open to the public. Okay. Um, can I just members welcome Colm today, who's participating with Skype. Um, Colm. Colm, you're very welcome. Colm self-isolating and being a very good example. And we also want to recognise that Sinead is also working remotely today and is watching online and she'll email any questions or comments that she has into the clerk. So uh, we have no apologies received uh, from the committee office. Um, any other apologies from any other members that you're aware of? No? Okay. So we'll move straight on to uh, item two, which is the legislative... Sorry, we'll not move on to that just quick. I just wanted to make a quick um, comment in regard to uh, today. And, and as we open today's committee, I want to make a short appeal to the public about what we're facing. Now is not the time for complacency or ignoring warnings. The virus is like nothing this generation has ever faced before, and its devastating consequences are there for all to see from China, Iran, Italy, and other parts of the world. We are living in extraordinary times, and we must all act responsibly to get through this together. The government advice on self-isolation and social distancing must be followed, or else the consequences for thousands in our families, social circles, and community could be fatal. To those ignoring the seriousness of this situation, please listen to the expert medical advice and consider others who you might come into contact with. I have confidence that the defiant spirit of our people that we will see this through. Temporary sacrifices in our daily lives can give us the time to prepare and finally overcome this virus for good. But this will only happen if we follow the expert advice that is given. This virus can affect everyone and anyone could pass it on. Someone more at risk than themselves. We can only do this if we fight it together. And I just want to make a comment about our amazing health professionals. Your dedication and bravery in the face of this threat is an inspiration to us all. As a community, we must not let you down by ignoring the guidance. To all the people in Northern Ireland, stay positive, take precautions, and look forward to this dark hour in our history ending soon. Together, we will beat COVID-19. So thank you, members. OK, so we're moving on to item two of uh, the agenda, and that's the legislative consent motion for the coronavirus bill. And I refer members to papers at tab two of the meeting pack. I may advise members that officials are here to brief the committee on the legislative consent motion laid by the Health Minister in respect of the coronavirus bill introduced at Westminster. So I want to welcome uh, Ms Cathy Harrison, Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, and Mr. Andrew Dawson, Director of Workforce Policy. Um, you're very, very welcome. Um, glad to see you here and glad to have you at a distance. Um, and uh, I would invite you now to uh, brief and then we shall ask you some questions. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much and good morning. Um, we're here, as, as you say, to brief uh, on the specific issues with regard to the Northern Ireland health provisions in the coronavirus bill. Uh, this is the bill as uh, introduced at Westminster last week. Uh, if you're content, uh, Chair and Deputy Chair, if I was to read the opening statement, then if we could maybe direct any of the pharmacy questions to Cathy, first of all, because Cathy's under a lot of time pressure today just to, to deal with uh, some pharmacy issues, that would be helpful. I really appreciate that, yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the Department of Health and other Northern Ireland departments, along with the devolved administrations in Scotland and Wales, have contributed to the UK-wide coronavirus action plan, which was published by the UK Government on the 3rd of March 2020. The action plan highlights the procedures which need to be put in place to delay and to mitigate the threat posed by COVID-19. Among the suite of measures identified in the action plan is the introduction of the coronavirus bill, which will ensure that the UK has robust, proportionate and effective legislative measures to deal with the impact of a widespread COVID-19 outbreak. The coronavirus bill was introduced at Westminster on the 19th of March 2020 and contains emergency provisions that we need to have at our disposal to, to deploy only if required. From a Northern Ireland perspective, the coronavirus bill is being used to provide relevant Northern Ireland departments with the necessary and proportionate legislative powers to allow them to act in a rapid and effective way to deal with a severe pandemic. The main purpose of the coronavirus bill is as follows. 
To minimise the potential health impact by slowing spread in the UK and overseas and reducing infection, illness and death. To minimise the potential impact on society and the UK and global economy, including key public services. To maintain trust and confidence amongst the organisations and people who provide key public services and those who use them. To ensure the dignified treatment of all affected. And to ensure that all agencies with responsibility for tackling the outbreak are properly resourced to do so, that they have the people, equipment and medicines they need. The provisions pertaining to health are as follows. Uh, emergency registration of health professionals, clauses 2 and 4 and schedules 1 and 3 to the Bill. These provisions allow for the registrars for various professions, uh, for example nurses, uh, allied health professionals, other professionals and pharmacists, to allow temporary registration of people who would not otherwise be eligible for registration to enable gaps in the workforce to be filled. This may be used to enable the readmission of retirees or final year students. The power is to be exercised with close cooperation between the Department of Health and the relevant registrars. Uh, turning to mental health and mental capacity, Clause 9 and Schedules 9 and 10, uh, these provisions relate to the existing law that allows people to be detained or deprived of their liberty because of mental disorder or because they lack mental capacity. They relax requirements such as allowing relevant social workers to carry out the functions of approved social workers, allowing longer time periods to make decisions and to facilitate remote working in the decision making. The purpose behind the provision is to help reduce the potential burden on, health and so on the health and social care service. Clause 12 deals with health service indemnification. This provision seeks to provide indemnities for health and social care activity and allows the Department of Health to indemnify or make arrangements to indemnify persons who are doing jobs that they are not normally covered for within the health and social care service. Clauses 35 and 36 and Schedule 15 Part 3 and Schedule 16 Part 3 uh, are, are only in relation to childcare providers. The provisions of Part 3 of Schedule 15 enable the Department of Health to give directions requiring the temporary closure of childcare provision. Part 3 of Schedule 16 provides for temporary continuity directions which will allow the Department of Health to, provide, to require childcare providers to stay open if some are closing prematurely. Clause 45 suspends the uh, relevant pension regulations uh, that exist in Northern Ireland uh, that would otherwise uh, preclude uh, HSC pension service members who have retired from coming back to work. Those regulations will be suspended and therefore they're, they're, that will remove a barrier uh, for uh, retired members of the HSC pension service to come back to work. Clause 46 and Schedule 17 uh, concern the, pub the protection of public health. These clauses make new provision for powers to deal uh, with public health and mainly enable the making of regulations by the Department of Health to allow for measures to be introduced to help delay or prevent further transmission of an infection from COVID-19, which pre presents or could present significant harm to human health. It also gives powers to district judges in magistrates' courts to make orders in relation to people, premises or things uh, upon application by the public health agency. These provisions are equivalent to powers that have already been exercised in England and Wales in relation to coronavirus. <coughs> uh, powers relating to potentially infectious persons are dealt with at Clause 49 and Part 5 of Schedule 20. These provisions give powers to public health officers, such as officers of the Public Health Agency or anyone acting under their direction uh, under arrangements for dealing with coronavirus. The powers are exercisable only if two safeguards are met, a general one and a specific one, and these are one, the Department of Health must make a declaration that COVID-19 is a serious and imminent threat in Northern Ireland, and two, that the public health officer has reasonable grounds to suspect that a particular person is or may be infectious. If so, the public health officer can direct the person to go to a suitable place to undergo screening and assessment or quarantine. Part 5 of Schedule 20 also provides the same powers for police officers and immigration officers. It's important to make clear that the coronavirus bill will operate on a time-limited basis and is not intended to remain in place in perpetuity. It will expire after a maximum of two years 
unless Parliament considers it necessary to extend further. Uh, I appreciate this morning that the committee is being asked to consider the Northern Ireland health provisions within a very short time frame, um, and we're hoping that you'll be understanding that we in, uh, in the department and in the HSC generally are operating in extraordinary circumstances uh, and are working as fast as we can to take the necessary steps to have legislative provisions in place. Uh, so, unfortunately, we're, we're squeezing uh, policy and legislation development in, that would normally take months or even years into a few days and possibly hours. Um, so I trust we would have your understanding in that uh, and we will now uh, try between the four of us to answer any questions you would have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we will have the first round of questions now um, directly relating to um, pharmacy so that Cathy can answer those and so that she can get away. Cathy, we really do appreciate your attendance here. Obviously, we've had, we've all had a great deal of correspondence uh, and conversations with lots of pharmacists in particular uh, who are under incredible pressure. And we understand that. Um, so, I just want to um, ask you, Cathy, uh, what type of impact you expect from extending the prescribing powers um, and also whether. Do you think, um, in terms of the uh, the bill coming forward, the emergency registration of health professionals and the emergency volunteers, do you see that of being um, all of use to pharmacists in particular? Yeah. Um, in terms of the impact of extending the prescribing powers, we're hoping that the impact will see that we will have um, uh, over 200. Uh, pharmacists who would be capable of coming back onto the register. Um, we're focusing Im immediately on um, people who have left the register, recently retired within the last three years. We know there's about 350 of those, but some are no longer a resident in Northern Ireland, so we're focusing on um, around 200 to 240. Uh, so that would be a positive impact. Yeah. Obviously, in, no individual is required to return, yeah. but we would, they would be automatically put onto the register if they're considered fit uh, to do so. Okay. That's good. And, and in terms of volunteers, um, a lot of work going on in this space at the moment, and the, the community and voluntary sector will be absolutely critical in supporting our pharmacy services, um, in community pharmacy and our wider health service in the coming days. Mm, that's great, and I, and I know uh, certainly on, on the ground that there has been a very encouraging uh, amount of community people coming forward, willing to help, and willing and really willing to help pharmacists. So if there's a way in which they can do that, that's very welcome. Uh, members, we're going to stick with it, the, the two questions for this round, and then we'll we'll, we'll do more as as we're able to do as time allows. Uh, and, but I want to go to, uh, straight to Colm first to see if he has any. Questions and then Julie. So, I was going to ask you about the problem of the treaty. Say, Colin? Colin? Sorry, yeah. can, can you just back off from your uh, device? You're coming through very loud. It's going to change when the That's better. That's better. Okay, we can hear you now, I hope. Yeah. So, what types of support community parts? And secondly, uh, equipment and in terms of storage are also as Elish, do you have that? Okay, the, the clerk, we, we can't make it very well, Colin, but Elish is going to uh, try and make sense of. I think if I've got it correctly, the question was what steps would be taken in relation to support community pharmacy and a further question about any update on equipment being supplied. Um, but Colin will probably email me if there's any further detail on that. Okay. okay, so first of all, in terms of community pharmacy, we've already taken some steps. Obviously, we are working as quickly as we can to do everything that we can do. So immediately we did take action in terms of decisions around financial stability for community pharmacies and um, in terms of an advance of um, a one month payment from uh, what they would normally get paid you know, from the business services organisation. That money will uh, start to go into their system. The important part about that was pharmacies are spending a lot more money on drugs and we wanted to remove any risk that there would be any problem with paying bills. On top of that, additional money has been bid for and I'm expecting um, a, a decision on that 
around so that we can provide additional money right now for staffing, uh, adaptations to premises and also for additional services such as deliveries. So we are working very, very quickly. There's a whole other range of things that we're doing for community pharmacies to relieve pressure on the pharmacists who are working there um, in terms of removing the need for them to um, comply with continuum professional development schedules, um, which would have all been due now in the coming <coughs> weeks. And um, also done a lot of work to try and get as many pharmacists who work in other sectors to step forward. We've put in place arrangements to make it easy for pharmacists who want to help to come forward and work in community pharmacies. But there's a lot, um, with your permission, I can provide more detail on that because I have a communication that went out last week that sets out for four pages the interventions that we're making with community pharmacy. And we're taking this very seriously. We're doing as much as we can do, as quickly as we can do for community pharmacy. In terms of equipment, per personal per Protective equipment has been provided to community pharmacies and more may be provided that's been provided to be used in line with current guidance. Um, obviously PPE is an issue that we are dealing with across the health service and it is of concern for all health and social care workers. Um, Jerry. Thanks. Um, <coughs> Sorry, Colin, were you wanting to come back in? Yes, the Okay. Well, with protection for, uh, of supply of equipment and see to the independent sector, including nursing homes, independent domiciliary care. Okay. Colin, that we're breaking up and we haven't received your email yet, but I think we get the gist of it. I think you're concerned about the PPE uh, for, the, for the rest of the independent sector. Um, I don't know in relation to pharmacy what that connection is. Can you just say the first part of the question again, Colm, see if I can hear you? What plans to supply the sector? Oh, yes, Leroy. Uh, Colm, we'll return to you later with your question because we can't make it out. And if you can email that through. To the clerk, thank you. Okay. And we'll go to Jerry and then Paula. In terms of PPE, yes. could I could I just suggest that yes. that would be better to be referred to the department because it, this it is not directly related okay. to the business today. Although I understand that there are a lot of questions, because um, that could. Okay, fair enough, okay. Kathy. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Um, Kathy, just a question about uh, pharmacists. of stuff about emergency volunteers, but that's probably yourself uh, after that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, can you just detail, please, Kathy, just on, under the changes? Um, um, people who couldn't register under this 1976 pharmacy order can now register as pharmacists. Can you just detail, is that people who have retired or what that is? Just um, it's, this, the, the provisions here would allow us as a department to um, connect with the Pharmaceutical Society of Northern Ireland and ask their registrar to temporarily register an individual or groups of pharmacists. We did not have those powers before and we needed the emergency powers that this bill allows. Um, so that would allow us to work very quickly now to identify cohorts of pharmacists. So we're, fo we're focusing on the retired pharmacists to begin with. And we also will look at a later date at other pharmacists who are near registration. And um, we, we can come back to that to get as many pharmacists back into our workforce as the COVID-19 um, response um, continues. OK. Good enough. Yep, thanks. Okay. Paula? Um, thank you. And thank you for your work on this, Cathy. I mean, I think this is a time when we've really come to really appreciate the community pharmacists and what they're doing out there. Um, can I just clarify, are you saying that that it's universal that the PPE equipment has been delivered. So all pharmacists by now should have adequate PPE. Yes. Okay. Um, you you'd mentioned there about almost people coming forward. Is there? Is, are we going to get to the time whenever practice-based pharmacists are mandated to come out of the GP practices and in the community pharmacies? <coughs> Okay, so Paula, that it's. Um, thank you for your question. Um, pharmacists were, um, are in high demand across the whole health service and we need to make sure that we're optimising their skills. Mm -hmm. So the approach that I am taking is not to mandate anyone okay. to do anything at this stage, but we are having a great response from pharmacists okay. who want to help. 
Um, general practices are busy too. Our community pharmacies at the moment are doing a fantastic job. They're really rising to the challenge. They are seeing the first wave, if you like, of public demand here, and they really are doing a terrific job. We're doing everything we can to help them, and that is why I'm focusing on calling out to all pharmacists in Northern Ireland to step forward and do a little bit, whatever they can do. I mean, every part of the health service is stretched at the moment. I um, I would not be in favour of mandating anyone in terms of moving sector or making people do things. I don't think it's necessary, Paula. Okay. I think that we're getting, people are realising that they, they really want to help and our pharmacists are looking at their, at the end of the day, Northern in Northern Ireland, it's their colleagues, it's their friends mm -hmm. that they may have studied with, they can see they're under pressure and they're, looking, they're stepping forward and we're also making it as easy as possible for them to do that by stepping forward to locum. They will be paid for that and we'll be providing money to community pharmacies to pay them. Okay. So we're trying to join the here okay. and join everything up so that people can come forward and I would love to see you know as many pharmacists coming forward as possible yeah. we've suggested a morning an evening anything that they can do is uh, would be of great value at the moment to community pharmacy thank you just one last question chair um, you, you talked there about the students that pre um, get approaching pre-registration or whatever the proper term is what about the university students and what role do you see them playing then in this sort of crisis time so I'm talking to the universities as well about the role that pharmacy students could have. At this moment in time, pharmacy students are you know, encouraged to help where they can. And I'm still working through with the universities around exam schedules and things like that. Um, and I, ha I suppose my first focus would be on our pre-registration students mm -hmm. who are already graduated and they are nearing the end of their pre-registration 12 months. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of taking it step by step. Okay. You know, and I'm, th I'm thinking that retired first, then our pre-registration, and certainly there would be a role for our students more in terms of helping in general in the pharmacy. Yeah. Obviously, I'm not go I'm not going to be advocating putting them on the register as pharmacists, mm -hmm. um, but there would be a lot they could do to help with the general pressures in pharmacy, in community, and um, and in hospital as well. Okay, th thank you, Cathy. Thank you, Jay. Okay. Alex. Yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, in terms of delivery um, and supply, is is that secured? The, the the supply demand for medicines to come in, and also in terms of delivery out into the community. Um, in England, they announced yesterday it was a million and a half elderly and um, the ones that are most at risk. Um, is there plans for that in place? And how many people would that involve out of interest? Okay, so two things there. The general medicine supply chain is flowing. Okay. And across the UK, obviously, we know from all the work we did in EU Exit, we know a lot about our medicine supply chain. It's become very useful uh, right now. So medicine supply chain is flowing. However, the demand from the public for prescription medicines is um, has been tremendous. So in Northern Ireland, some of our pharmacies are reporting more than four times the volume of prescription items. And we know that our GPs have ordered double the amount of paper to print their prescriptions on. So the, this, uh, the, unfortunately, you know, they're, they're, the messages around stockpiling and over-ordering have not totally got through to the public. And you know, I would like to really make a plea to people that there is no need to over-order and there's no need to stockpile medicines, that we've got to keep that medicine supply chain flowing. Unfortunately, there are, you know, there's always pressures in the supply chain. And at the moment, they, I envisage, are short-term pressures caused by this incredible spike in demand and we have very good arrangements and very good intelligence around where we have particular concerns around supplies and um, you know we can take action to address particular concerns but in general supply chain is flowing but it does rely very much on everyone playing their part uh, not over ordering or stockpiling medicines of any type. Um, the, just, yeah. Sorry to interrupt just on that point um, would it be would it be of use then if the um, repeat prescribing was to come to pharmacy? Would that help to control that issue of the, the stockpiling issue? And, and, and why are GPs kind of allowing uh, that public demand to actually follow through? Well, we're work we are working with our GP colleagues very, very closely now because it, it, we are really, really joining up here in our response for COVID. So, um, and we are um, working and 
we're taking, as I think I said at the start, we're working by the hour on measures that, that we need to take here. We're working with general practice and we will be providing um, additional advice out to, for the public and for general practice and for community pharmacies this week around the management of prescriptions so, and everything is being taken into consideration, how we manage repeats and also how, you know, how we communicate between general practice and community pharmacies. Okay, sorry, don't drop that. And, sorry, there was a second part to that. Do you want yeah, me to yeah, take Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> The second part was around the deliveries uh, from pharmacies and the new guide advice that was um, issued yesterday around shielding. I think you're, is, that, is that you're interested in the numbers that yeah. that would involve? Um, so that there's an it's an estimated 40,000 people in Northern Ireland. So per pharmacy, we're around 90, you know, just over slightly over 90 per pharmacy, and we're working with. We will be working now with community pharmacy to support deliveries to those people. But the advice for everyone is, where possible, to ask a family member, a friend or a neighbour to collect your prescriptions for you. And then, where, need, where needed in extreme situations when people have no other help at all, um, the pharmacies could, would be in a position to deliver, but we really have to preserve those services for the people most at need for deliveries, and that would include the shielding uh, categories of patients. Okay, thank you. Um, Alan? Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Cathy, I'd just like to place on record that uh, those pharmacists who do decide to come back into the workplace are certainly demonstrating a great public spirit. Um, can I ask... Um, in terms of uh, the ones that do come back into the workplace, how will it be utilised? Um, who will do coordinate their deployment? And will they be deployed locally where possible? And I would appreciate that somebody coming out of retirement and have been three years away from the, the workplace um, might feel that they're a bit rusty. And in fact, that might be a, a, an obstacle to some of them maybe coming back because they'd be nervous about the fact they'd been so long away. That's a very responsible job, as, as you know. Um, will they be supported um, or will they be sort of thrown in at the deep end uh, when, they, when they come back into the workplace? No, um, no, anyone who comes forward will be very welcome, but of course they will have to consider themselves if they are you know, fit and able to come back into practice. In terms of their ongoing training and the need for sort of return to practice, we have, uh, we have acted very, very quickly and our postgraduate provider of education already has information ready to go now for any pharmacists who may be considering coming back into practice or maybe, and also for those people who I said earlier, might want to do a little bit more. Pharmacists uh, work across different sectors, community, hospital and general practice and, and some of those who will have retired will have had very specialist jobs and may have also held very senior jobs at, um, at, by the time they retired. So everyone will be welcome and of course we will be helping to coordinate them and get them into the sectors where they would be of most use and uh, providing them with all the support that they need. They will be paid and the way that we're asking them to come forward is through the locum arrangements that the Ulster Chemist Association of Northern Ireland have put in place. That means that people can come to one, se one central point and, uh, and then they'll, they'll be matched to suitable positions. Um, but we'll be doing it very carefully to make, some, make the most of their skills but also to do it in terms of their competence and what they can deliver. Thanks, Cathy. Thank okay, you. thank you. Is there anything from Sinead or Colin there? I'll just check. Uh, yeah, I have something from Sinead. Um, so it's about extended prescribing powers. What safeguards are in place to encourage pharmacists to return to the workplace, um, including private workspaces with social distancing? And will those returning necessarily be in public facing roles? Could, sorry, could I ask you to the, repeat the first part again? Or what safeguards are in place to encourage pharmacists to return to the workplace? For example, private workspaces with social distancing. Um, and do these have to be public-facing rules? Um, so they don't have to be public-facing rules. There will be decisions will be made about how, what the best way to, to use these their skills um, as they come forward. And in terms of safeguards for the workplace, um, the, you know, community pharmacies have already taken steps to and put in place some measures around safeguarding and uh, so around social distancing and compliance with that. 
and, um, and I'm hoping to provide additional funding to pharmacies quite quickly now for all pharmacies to be able to put in those measures and measures that they will feel comfortable with. So anyone returning would be would be covered by that in community. Okay. But the, not everyone will come in, come back to community pharmacy, but you know, I hope many will. Okay, another thing from Colin. Colin, are you happy enough? <laughs> yeah, I've lost my Thank you. Um, yeah. Cathy, I think it would be sufficient to, to let you go. I know you're incredibly busy and, and thank you so much for your time and then we can ask some questions of Andrew. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks everyone. Thank you. So Andrew, um, can I just ask you in terms of uh, workforce in, in more generality, uh, what types of roles do you anticipate that formerly retired persons might actually um, perform or not perform? Sure. So um, there are a number of elements to this. The first is that the uh, regulators, so in this the GMC for, for doctors, the Nursing and Midwifery Council for Nurses and Midwives, uh, the Healthcare Professions Council for Allied Health Professionals, have all written to recently retired um, staff um, um, just to gauge their uh, interest in coming back in to fight COVID-19. Uh, trusts then have also been writing to staff who they know from their records are recently retired as well. Uh, and those are, we're trying to encourage those uh, those people to come back in and they'll be very welcome uh, if, if they do choose to do so. Um, in terms of numbers, I think there's something in the order of over 500 recently retired medics um, who have been approached in Northern Ireland. Uh, I don't have the figures in relation to nurses, midwives and allied health professionals, but we're definitely trying to encourage anyone who was recently retired, and that's probably within the last three years initially, uh, to come back into service. Um, in addition then um, to that, and I don't know whether you want me to, to come on to the student plans that might be Thanks, um, so again what what has been done and this is trying to be done on a UK wide basis if it's all possible uh, is that final year students uh, are trying to accelerate their progression into into the workforce uh, for Northern Ireland I think that's something in the order of 250 final year medical students who can be deployed uh, early, about four months earlier than intended it's 880 uh, third year nursing students who can be deployed uh, 120 uh, allied health professionals um, and I think also something in the order of 240 social workers as well um, can be deployed earlier than, than expected uh, and we are working very closely indeed with uh, the schools and the registrars for each of those professions uh, just to try and smooth the way for that and trying to get that done as quickly as possible. Key is just that we are trying to maximise the available workforce so we're looking both retirees uh, and uh, students as well. Just in relation finally to retirees clause um, uh, one of the clauses in the bill uh, deals with uh, the suspension of pension uh, regulations, uh, clause 45. And again, that's just a designed uh, clause 45 to ensure that we remove any barriers uh, for um, staff who have, are just recently members of the HSC pension scheme. Uh, and normally, if they were they draw down their pension, um, then if they were to earn that, that could have uh, significant impacts on their tax, etc. So those regulations are going to be suspended uh, again on a UK-wide basis. That's very welcome news uh, indeed. Colin, have you any questions before we move on to Paula here? No. Okay, Paula. Um, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Andrew. S see for those um, nurses or who have a re um, applied for return to practice, can their applications be fast-tracked? We're looking at just a number of uh, ways in which they can be put through as, very, as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, so the par part of the purpose of the coronavirus bill is, I think, just to allow for those kind of moves to be taken in terms of registration and okay. re-registering, etc. Um, but yes, we, we will be p looking at, at, at intending to put any kind of, I suppose, um, departmental and system uh, endorsement behind getting this through as quickly as possible. So whatever we can do to, to do it as quickly as possible, we will. That specific category? <coughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, the second part is, um, you see nurses here 
um, based overseas and they have an application process to come and, and um, work here. Mm -hmm. There's a fee in place for them to actually sit the exams. Is there any way that that's going to be waived at this time to try and speed that up? Again, we haven't uh, done that in relation to the, the bill. Um, Again, we, we're, all options, I think, are on the table um, for this. I would say, however, with, I suppose, the, the increasing restrictions on international travel, etc., we will probably see a downturn in, in the number of international nurses uh, coming in. The other thing to, to bear in mind in respect of the international nurse recruitment uh, issue um, is that uh, we, uh, our clinical education centre, so the, the, the centre that will be responsible for training the 880 third year nurses earlier than expected, would also then be expected to, to um, help to train the international nurses as well. So there is only so much capacity that that, that centre has. So I think the priority will be the 880 uh, third year nursing students uh, and what and we certainly any international nurses that do arrive on, on these shores over the next few days and weeks we we'll certainly welcome them with with open arms and they will be uh, trained and, and um, certainly will be very welcome but there, there are just those sort of practical issues okay. as well um, the, the other question I'm not sure it's in relation to the bill but did I see something on the internet over the weekend there about the car parking charges for Nurses and healthcare workers to be waived in the hospitals. Is that? I saw something okay. uh, similarly nothing, online. Nothing official then. Um, again, I don't have the detail, but we can certainly get some detail for you today on okay. that from from colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, just some general questions. Hopefully, Andrew, for yourself. Um, the emergency volunteers. Sure. Um, so, just the language was kind of. My reading of it was a bit sort of contradictory. Um, can you just break down, are these people who are being redeployed to volunteer and are they still getting a wage from their current employer um, or are they not getting paid for a period of, I think it's up to four weeks? Um, and the powers to detain, is that your...? That's not me, I think. Okay, <laughs> right, just checking that. Um, and I think that's me for now. Yeah, okay. so... Uh, so emergency volunteers then are dealt with at clauses 7, uh, schedule 6 and clause 8 of the, uh, the bill. Um, and we in the Department of Health have been working with our colleagues in the Department for the Economy uh, on this. Uh, essentially what clause 7 and schedule 6 do uh, is to put in place a new type of leave, a special unpaid leave called emergency volunteer leave. Uh, and the Department for the Economy are working on the various employment rights elements of that. So, again, this is this is talking about uh, a framework for skilled volunteers to step in and provide support for the health and social care system uh, without the fear of losing their employment protections. And again, it's a new temporary unpaid statutory right for eligible employees and workers to take emergency volunteering leave. Emergency volunteering leave can be taken during volunteering periods of 16 months. <laughs> Uh, 16 weeks initiated by the UK government, so this is a UK-wide scheme into which we will will contribute. Uh, it um, is, sorry, it, it is unpaid, sorry. But uh, the important thing then is, clo is the following clause. Clause 8 provides for a compensation scheme, okay. again on a UK-wide basis. Uh, so the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care will be um, under the, uh, under the uh, Coronavirus Act, as we hope it will be. Uh, will be able to establish a scheme uh, whereby those uh, workers who, who take this unpaid leave will be able to um, claim for loss of earnings under this uh, UK-wide scheme and that UK-wide loss of earnings scheme for those uh, emergency volunteers is being designed at the moment on a UK-wide basis. So I was on a conference call last week with, um, <coughs> with the HSC, uh, Department for Business and uh, Treasury colleagues as well just designing that scheme so there will be ability to claim for loss of earnings and I think they're also looking at travel expenses as well. So just if you get a bit of clarity just on that, I mean so somebody takes a period of leave for four weeks isn't the maximum? I think, yes, yeah. Um, I mean presumably, because we want to encourage that where possible obviously, um, mm -hmm. I just don't want people to be out of pocket you know, generally but also for a long period of time so is there any idea whether that's going to be processed quickly in terms of the, the, the recovery payment uh, or is there any indication of that? Certainly those conversations are being had uh, at the moment just in terms of what the, the compensation scheme is going to look like, how it will operate etc. Obviously we do not want, there to, uh, 
uh, any bar or any kind of barrier to people who are going to be, um, you know, putting putting themselves out uh, and helping uh, helping the efforts. Um, so certainly, the the emphasis will be on. Um, making the this, this system as quick and as easy to navigate as possible. But I would say that this is a UK-wide scheme, so uh, we are certainly encouraging that in the discussions. Thanks. Yeah, c can you explain what do you mean by the retired medics? Are they doctors or what, what are yes, they? Do yes, doctors right, okay. um, primarily. Um, yeah. Uh, we're we're also we're looking at all professions, so uh, doctors, dentists, pharmacists, as Cathy said, um, psychologists, um, nurses, midwives, and allied health professionals. What about ambulance staff? Again, ambulance staff uh, are regulated by the Healthcare Professions Council, so again, the call will have gone out um, to recently retired ambulance staff as well. Okay. And from and, trust. Yeah, you know, just to agree with my colleague across the way, I think all staff need to have their car parking charges waived. Sure. Okay, thank you. I will pass it on. Pass that on. Yeah. Cer certainly over this period, anyway. Yeah. Okay. Alan? Thank you. Um, and you may not be able to answer this, but just uh, if you can, in, in terms of your call to the retired medics, um, has the early response from that sector has it been encouraging? We um, again, uh, we on the in the department, I think, published on our website last week the the call from Northern Ireland. Uh, uh, that was designed to go out in time, in the same time as the GMC uh, call to retired medics. Um, I haven't uh, yet seen the early figures coming from that, uh, but certainly uh, we will be reviewing those. If there's anything else we need to do additional to what has already been done in terms of communications, we'll certainly do it. Thank you. Okay, and uh, I think Sinead has a question. Um, the more uh, question of a more general nature, um, in terms of the time limit of the bill, which is a maximum of two years, um, any comment in relation to this being changed to allow for a six monthly review? Second, any uh, what measures will be used to determine whether we have achieved a safe stage to step down this legislation, and what input would the regions have in making that determination? Third, oh. if a decision is dependent on testing. Is it not essential that all regions should be testing at the same level immediately? Okay. In terms of the review of the bill, that is um, a matter for the uh, UK government, I think, to decide those provisions. Uh, in terms of step down, similarly, that will be, again, led, I think, by the UK government on the basis of the available scientific and medical advice. Uh, the impact of the regions, again, we, we would intend that there would be a, um, a lot of input from regions to do that. Certainly, the, the experience to date in the, in the development of the bill has been very encouraging in terms of the, the uh, input of all uh, devolved administrations. So, we would hope that that would continue as well. Uh, in terms of testing, again, that's uh, more of, a, I think, a medical and public health issue. Uh, but as I understand it, there is an interim protocol in place. Uh, there are a number of priority categories for testing. Um, and again, I think there's, there's ongoing. Uh, work among pu with public health con uh, colleagues on that, but I don't, can't speak authoritatively on those issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that the testing issue will we'll raise that with your with your colleague. Um, Colin, are you happy enough? Are you anything you want to come back in with? Um, no, I can't hear it. Okay. okay. Uh, can I thank you very much, Andrew, and we'll allow your colleagues to come forward. So, just to welcome Mr. Thomas Adel, Head of Mental Health and Capacity Unit, and Mr. Nigel McMahon, Chief Environmental Health Officer. So, you're very uh, welcome. Thank you. And um, I don't know if you have any comments you want to make. Briefly, before we, or do you want us to go straight to questions? Uh, maybe just for the clarity of the, the committee, that uh, I can take questions in relation to um, clause 46 and 17, which is the public health powers, and clause 49 and schedule 20, which are the clauses related to potentially infectious persons. Okay. That's grand. Uh, I suppose, um, <coughs> just to kick off first on the testing issue, um, is there anything in this bill that, that helps us with this testing issue? And I'm thinking um, in relation to, uh, and I'm giving this as an example, 
the likes of a company such as Randox not being nice approved? And is there an opportunity here actually to to use um, the skills that they have in order to, to help the testing issue? Because I think we all realise how vital the testing issue is, and in particular, into ensuring that uh, that our that our key health workers can actually come back to work uh, once they would know that they were safe to do so. Well, I would just reiterate what Andrew said, I suppose, and though I'm aware that discussions are going on, um, there's nothing specific in the legislation that I'm aware of that relates to that particular issue. Perhaps you would carry that message back from the committee to the department. Okay. Um, Colin, have you any particular questions? Here. No. We're here. Okay. Thank you. Um, Paula? Um, thank you, thank you um, for coming along this morning. It's just about the mental capacity. It was to do with um, additional support and resources in relation to anybody who might be affected. We're talking about the patient generally or specifically here, who may be affected by the introduction of these new provisions, because obviously this is a very stressful time for everybody in the country and then people who are affected by this. It might be um, they may need, need additional support in an already overstretched um, sector. And then also then what safeguards will be put in place so that if a social worker, for example, is acting alone in terms of one of these deprivation of liber lib dirty, liberty sorry, orders, to, to make sure that their um, decision making is robust and um, stands up to scrutiny. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's testing times and it's testing them for all of us, including people who are deprived of liberty, uh, obviously. Um, we are providing as much help and support as we can. To, so we provide extra material for people at Private Liberty to explain the emergency provisions. Um, and we, we're trying to help the health care professionals to carry out this as effectively as possible. The amendments in the bill, in, in the coronavirus bill, will make things slightly easier for professionals in terms of who can do functions. We're not removing any particular safeguards. So there will never be the decision of one person to deprive some liberty. There must always be at least two people. Okay. So you will never have a social worker acting by themselves. There will always also have to be a medical report, um, and the function of a trust panel for a longer-term detention is still there, um, and the person will always have the right to appeal the decision to the tribunal as well. Okay. So the, the safeguards are still there. It's who can do the safeguards, which is slightly modified. Okay, sorry, apologies. I thought I'd read that it was, it was coming down to one person that could report your saying it would still have to require two people. Yeah, it would always require at least two people. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Jerry? Thanks, Chair. Um, Nigel, yourself, um, just a, a couple of specific questions on powers to detain. Uh, can you just detail what the extra powers are in terms of what's in place now and what's the extra powers proposed? Um, and detail how long can people be detained? I saw uh, some reports in England, people may be detained up to a month, so if you can comment if that's accurate and if that's relevant to here. Um, also, what at what, po what what extra powers do immigration <coughs> officers have, uh, and at what point? I know there's reference to police um, being involved in some aspects. Uh, at what point does that happen? And reading the, the legislation, it seems to be that they can extend the powers to detain for 24 hours uh, of certain people. Is that a one-off extension, or can that be moved over for multiple extensions? Um, so I'd appreciate if you'd offer uh, answer those questions. Okay. Um, maybe if you just give a quick summary of Clause 49 and uh, Schedule 20. Um, so these are the powers that allow public health officers, which in our context is effectively officers from the public health agency or somebody designated by them, uh, police and immigration officers, um, uh, to, to take action. Now, these are UK-wide powers that are being um, delivered regionally, if that's the right way to describe it. So um, these are a set of powers that are, are being described as powers that can be switched on and off in the different uh, uh, countries of the, the UK. So um, similar powers will apply in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. In terms of here, um, what would be required to bring the powers in would be for the Department of Health, having consulted with the Chief Medical Officer, to make a declaration that there is a serious and imminent, imminent threat to public health due to the incidence or transmission of coronavirus, and that uh, the exercise of the powers would be considered to be an effective means of delaying or preventing further transmission of the virus. Now, once that declaration is made and that period starts, then the powers come into being. 
Um, we, if we get to a point where the feeling is those powers are no longer effective, or indeed there's no, no ongoing serious imminent or threat, the Department's then required to revoke that declaration. Those powers then cease to exist, and any application of them uh, uh, immediately ends. Um, the provisions give powers to public health officers to require persons to go to a suitable health facility to undergo screening and assessment where they uh, reasonably suspect that that person has or may have coronavirus disease or has been in an affected area within the last 14 days and in the legislation that they're referred to as potentially infectious persons. So there are additional powers then for public health officers to impose other restrictions uh, on potentially infectious persons where they are necessary and, and proportionate. <coughs> so things like remaining in isolation, restrictions to their travel and other activities and contact with people, uh, probably commonly referred to as quarantine, although the legislation doesn't use that term. So uh, the provisions also confer uh, powers on public health officers and uh, constables to enforce those restrictions and requirements if required. Um, in terms of police and immigration, it gives them um, similar powers um, uh, in consultation with a public health officer where that's reasonably practical to do so. So a, a policeman or an immigration officer who has reason to believe that uh, somebody is uh, infected or, or likely to be infected can direct them to go then f uh, for the same screening and assessment and would seek advice from public health officer where that's possible in order to do that. Oh, um, in there. Sorry. Oh, no, I'll come in after you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, continue there. Oh, yes, you were asking about the time periods and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. In terms of direction for screening and assessment, um, that person can be detained for that purpose for up to a maximum of 48 hours. Uh, if after that screening and um, assessment they're found to be infected or indeed the test is inconclusive, um, then they can be required to stay in isolation for up to 14 days. Um, if that's the case, then that decision needs to be reassessed within 48 hours. And at the end of the 14 days, it can actually be extended up to a further 14 days. But if that's the case, then that decision needs to be reviewed every 24 hours. And the person who's being detained has a right of uh, appeal on the decision to a magistrate's court. And so I can just clarify, and I don't see the extension. Uh, so people, somebody is uh, told or directed to be in isolation for 14 days by the public health official, yeah. and the public health official can extend that period for 14 days? Yes. On top of the 14 days? Yes. And it has to be re reviewed every 24 hours by... Um, if if it, the original decision for 14 days needs to be reviewed again within at least 48 hours, mm -hmm. if there's a decision subsequently to extend for a further 14 days, then that decision needs to be reviewed every every 24 hours. And, and that those powers, sorry, sorry, just to clarify, they extend to all the public health officials that you named, yeah? Uh, well, yeah, the, the, um, the legislation uses the term public health officer, and in Northern Ireland that's either um, uh, a medical practitioner from the public health agency uh, or somebody designated by the public health agency. Yep. Thanks. Okay, Paul, you were looking in. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I should have got to this when I was going to have the floor, so to speak. Um, a few weeks ago, the chief medical officer came and I asked him around the powers within the Public Health Act um, to intervene um, in terms of, for example, that um, occasion was St Patrick's Day in the Holy Lands. Yes. So, Clause 50 there looks at powers relating to events, gatherings and premises. D does this enhance the powers then? For example, like yesterday I think that there were some, still some markets operating and there's, you know, is this going to allow then the, the executive office and possibly the councils to work then with the chief medical officer and public health agency to actually stop things from happening before beforehand? Yes, that's absolutely right. Um, if we just go back to the, the previous comments about uh, um, potentially infectious persons, we, we do have powers under the 1967 Act to do that. But um, it really only applies when somebody's already ill. Yes. Um, and uh, there aren't the same checks and, checks and balances, really, in terms of human rights and public rights in that that are reflected in, in this legislation. What the potentially infectious persons, uh, Schedule 20, does 
is allow those powers to be applied um, immediately. So in the scenario we're in now, where somebody's maybe travelled from a particular area and there's strong reason to, to believe they might be at risk um, or they're not showing symptoms but have possibly been tested positive, then this allows immediate action, whereas the 67 Act wouldn't. The 67 Act similarly does contain uh, powers for the public health agency to consider uh, uh, mass gatherings and so on and so forth. But again, uh, that's not a sort of an immediate power, and uh, um, Section 50 in the new bill does extend that and allows TEO to look across the piece and work with departments. Um, there is a specific requirement to consult with the Chief Medical Officer or his deputy yeah. um, in making any such decision to, to cancel an event or a mass gathering. So there doesn't have to be evidence that somebody, so it's more on the basis of the potential for community transmission? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think. We've been very clear all along that uh, the hope is that we won't need any of these yeah. these powers, uh, and it would only be in a circumstance where there is there is a you know blatant and obvious uh, disregard for the, the public advice that's been given, which thankfully for the most part hasn't been the case so far. Um, but I, I suppose in a scenario where somebody was saying that they were going to go ahead with a particular event regardless, mm -hmm. um, then the power in section 50 would allow um, potentially TEO then to step in. Uh, with health advice and and, and, uh, and prevent that from happening. Good, good to hear. Thank you. Uh, as welcome news, and can I just ask, um, would that also apply to events held on private land, which are not under any form of licensing? Should be any event, really. Anything. Yeah, it's really just on pub public health advice would be the key thing. Yeah. Um, if on consultation with the chief medical officer, it was felt that that particular gathering, whatever its nature, constituted a risk to public health, then it could be prevented from happening. Okay, Jerry, do you want to yes, thank you. Just on, on the clause 50, Nigel, um, does that extend for the two-year period as well uh, in terms of the sunset clause? Is that yes, um, the, the sunset clause is for the entire bill. Um, I did mention um, once or twice the department making regulations, and whilst we would be seeking to, to do that, they would also fall when the bill goes as well. So essentially then, for, as far as Northern Ireland is concerned, we'd be back to our 67 Act until such times as we, we brought forward um, new legislation. And that's the, sorry, the Executive Office has the power so, sorry to do suspend gatherings or events? It'll sit, it'll sit with, with the Executive Office, yeah. I think you know, in, in, in reality, obviously, it'll be in conjunction with whichever department or departments are likely to, to have an interest given the nature of the, the event or the gathering. Thanks. Alex? In terms of um, the power to stop events, which is good, does that include like gatherings? We had an incident over the weekend in Crawfordsburn at the beach where there were hundreds of youths, you know, young people gathering and drinking, whatever. Does that include that as well? I think it would, yes. I think the reading of the legislation is such that it could be any, any event or gathering. Okay. You know, clearly there's more practical issues around that, that kind of thing if, if you have to resort to the legislation. Um, and is there a number uh, what constitutes a gathering? Or? There isn't a number, no, in the so legislation. People it's, it, it's, purely, sorry, it's purely focused on public health advice, right. so um, it, would, it would come down to consultation with the Chief Medical Officer. So once this goes through tomorrow, we'll have the power to stop this gathering? Yeah. Um, if it goes through, yes. yes. Of course it will go through. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Very welcome. Um, Alan? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Just uh, in relation to uh, uh, gatherings, <coughs> does the legislation, uh, does it mean that if somebody is proposing to have a gathering, that they have to actually step forward and, and get permission to do it? Or does it mean that the authorities have to intervene if they learn that there's going to be a gathering? Um, and the other question, then, just for, for Thomas, maybe, uh, in terms of um, is the department anticipating uh, a surge in, in, in those presenting over coming weeks with mental health issues? And I know that all our medical staff, nursing staff, have been directed towards front line to, to fight the virus. Will our mental health provision, uh, which I know is stretched at the moment, will it be able to cope? if there is a surge in, in, in mental health issues? Okay, uh, thank, thank you for the question. Um, I would say I'm, we're, our department is actually not dealing with Section 50, you know, in, because it's TEO. Um, their officials have been working on the detail of it. Um, so I'm not sure I, uh, um, I can answer that, that question now, but we're quite happy to take that away and try and get an answer and come back to the committee maybe later on today. Yeah. 
in relation to mental health, the provisions in the in the bill would be more cover for staff not being able to deal with mental health patients, so not enable staff to carry out the functions required to detain and compulsory admit someone. We don't expect a search of the seriously mentally ill patient um, during this period. Uh, there might be an increase of anxiety and um, worry, yeah. which we would expect. And we're working with our colleagues in PHA and other parts of the department to try to find resources to help and support this, to provide further online resources, for example, which can be accessed by anyone without having uh, without any staff time. Um, but we don't expect a search of the seriously mental ill. But if the staff aren't available to carry out the functions, we then can't deal with the ones who already exist. So is it trying to find the balance between protecting people who are sick and the available staff we have? Thank you. And uh, Thomas, just on the, um, the Mental Capacity Act and the, the existing provisions that are, we know they're time consuming and it may not be in any way relevant to the fight against uh, coronavirus. Would it, um, could it be the case that, um, you know, that the, that the existing provision and the ongoing work with the Mental Capacity Act, you know, ceases for a period of time uh, while we deal with the current crisis? I mean, mental Capacity is obviously a very new piece of legislation and it's not yet fully commenced in the sense that uh, we still have a backlog of cases from before December of last year. Um, the, the right to be, to, to not be deprived of liberty without an authorization, it's, it's in European Convention of Human Rights. We, we can't suspend that right and indeed we think it would be quite dangerous to suspend the right um, to have protections against deprivation of liberty, because that would allow for arbitrary detentions. And that's why, for example, we have the powers to detain public health grounds in legislation. In, in reality, we have, to, we have to be pragmatic and say that there be some people where we might, might not be able to look at the backlog of cases. Um, that work is going to have to be scaled down. But that's, that's part of the implementation planning, rather than suspending legislation. So we might just slow that down, rather than stopping. Okay, that's, that's great, thank you. Uh, I think there's a, a comment, a question from Sinead. Chair, can I ask a quick, quick question? Sure. Apologies, I did this all last night. They keep coming back to me, some of the questions. Um, uh, uh, one of my constituents who works in the medical profession, member of the um, uh, Muslim community, ha was concerned that possibly some of the changes around um, disposable, not disposable, but um, the remains of the deceased, um, or the changes to the certification for for you know, the death certificates, is there any um, danger that they could maybe impact on customary practice around religious um, burials? I did try and look at it in the legislation. I just I think there's maybe some yeah. members of the community might be concerned about that. Uh, well, in terms of uh, clause 46, um, schedule 17, the public health powers. Um, they effectively give us powers to make regulations. So if we chose to go forward and make regulations uh, in respect of that, then we, we could. Um, and any regulations that are brought forward will, will obviously come to this, this, this committee and, and the Assembly. Um, there isn't anything specifically in the section on potentially infectious persons, but there is something else yeah. <laughs> somewhere in the bit in the that. bill. Um, yeah, it is. It, it, it is. Um, and uh, again, I, I I believe that there are there are powers that could be used um, if uh, if that was felt necessary that would affect those things. I think we're sort of seeing some of that happening organically anyway. You know, with. Um, there's lots of discussions going on with funeral directors in terms of their own practice and safety as well, and, and obviously the churches are implementing different measures too. So, again, it's one of those areas where you wouldn't like to um, um, to think that we'd need to introduce the legislation. Um, but clearly, we have quite different practices from that in England and Wales, so it may well be that a different approach needs, does need to be taken here. Okay. So, if you, could you keep the committee updated with that? Is there anything is forthcoming then? Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, Sinead's comments? Mm, it's a, a more general question again from a Northern Ireland perspective. Are you satisfied that the legislation as drafted is done so in a way that's cognizant of the resources available? I presume that's in relation to the public health um, section. Um, <clears throat> clearly, public health agencies are extremely stretched at the moment. And if the public were to disregard public health advice to the point where we needed 
to introduce or, or to use the powers in the bill when it comes in, and clearly that would put, it, would put extra burden on the public health agency. Very difficult to know um, to what extent that would be the case, whether you'd be talking about dealing with one or two individuals, possibly, you know, who were, who were refusing to comply, or whether it was a more, more um, widespread issue. Um, certainly the powers would be there, um, but I, I would accept that there would be no guarantee that the resources would necessarily be there to, to support um, a wider response under the legislation if we came to that. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Chair. Uh, clause 29, Nigel, is that your area as well? Uh, uh, inquests? Into no, it's not, I'm afraid. No, no. Okay. So, uh, so can you know? I'm afraid no. I'm afraid of no. Okay. Um, any further questions? Colin, have you a question at all? I can't hear. No, that's fine. Yeah, there. Okay, thank you. Um, um, sorry, Alan. Chair. If I could just ask the, uh, for, in terms of public health, just um, I know a lot of uh, restaurants have, have uh, diverted to preparing meals to deliver to vulnerable people or people who are self-isolating. And I know of one instance locally, um, a constituency that uh, was going to provide that service and had been taken up. Quite a lot of people were quite interested in it. But the local public health uh, reminded them of all the various regulations around delivering food, like it had to be labelled. Uh, the ingredients had to be labelled, the allergens had to be labelled, um, cooking instructions, storage instructions all had to be printed. So the guy who was doing this for the best will in the world uh, to provide a service has decided that he just can't, he can't deliver, he can't produce goods on, on that basis. Is there any you, uh, within public health that those sort of regulations, uh, which in normal circumstances are absolutely vital for public health, is there any proposal to perhaps relax um, that, or is that something that's just you, you just can't relax it? Um, well, I suppose I would first of all say that it's not directly a matter for the Department of Health. Um, I did see, possibly like yourselves, uh, uh, something about the relaxation of the, the, whatever the legislation is that prevents um, restaurants from, from doing uh, uh, takeaway and delivery. The second aspect is very much for the Food Standards Agency, and I know that that's, there's ongoing you know, discussions around that as well. There have been some relaxations, uh, but I can't actually say whether it's... Ref ref um, goes as far as the re relaxations that you're re referring to, um, but the Food Standards Agency is certainly the best, the best source of advice uh, on that because they're they're clearly trying to communicate with their stakeholders, including both the regulatory side within district councils in terms of what's expected of them and what can be relaxed, um, and indeed of, of the food chain and food processes and, and, and how this, this links in there. So um, I'm not sort of fully cited on what advice they're giving there, but um, it, 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 it is being worked on. I do know there's an issue for um, the District Council environmental health teams, which have largely suspended you know, inspections and and operations for sort of safety of their staff, uh, but that will obviously also release a certain amount of, of um, burden on businesses in terms of the programmed inspections that they usually receive. Okay, thank you, Alan. I, I think, uh, members, if, if there are no more questions, um, I would just like to, to thank um, our witnesses today, um, Thomas, Kathy, Andrew, and Nigel. And can I just say that we Fully appreciate the, uh, you know, the circumstances and the pressure that you are under as well in the department, and wish you well going forward um, uh, into this very uncertain period of time. Thank you very much for your attendance today. We we really do appreciate. It. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. So obviously, we know this is our only opportunity, really, to discuss the uh, the LCM ahead of tomorrow's assembly debate, and there'll be um, 
no opportunity for the committee to report to the Assembly in a normal way. So the, the Assembly is being asked to give its, um, for, formally to give its consent to the UK Parliament legislating on the, the range of devolved matters, which of course includes aspects of health and the Assembly. We'll wish to know the view of the committee if we can come to uh, an agreement. So um, uh, I would underscore that any view expressed is without prejudice to the committee's role in scrutinising the implementation of the legislation and uh, comment or recommendations in relation to it in the future. So I don't know, members, if you have, if any of you have a, a comment to make or follow. Um, I, I saw a message coming through on the phone there that the UK government has agreed to a six-month review of the legislation, which is to be welcomed. But I think that we as a committee should be even getting table papers on a regular basis around us. The issue I raised there at the end regarding regulations around um, the deceased remains and stuff, I just think that we just need to make sure that the powers are being exercised and that there's any fundamental changes that, that, that they're obviously having to derogate from um, provisions that we are given good um, and regular updates on how the legislation is going to be rolled out and being implemented. Okay, and Colin, do you have a comment? Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me at all. You're quite loud, so if you want to... Back up. <laughs> okay, is that better? That's comment? much better. I suppose my comment would be that in normal times we would be opposing many of the measures in this legislative consent motion. And in normal times we would insist on greater scrutiny of these powers. We are not, however, in normal times. Uh, we are in times that require unusual action and solidarity, community and societal community and legal approach. So, in that sense, they, they, we require these powers at this time, unusual and extreme as that is. Appreciate that. Thank you, Colm. Jerry? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, the, you know, following that, there's some, there's some important and essential stuff in this. Um, I mean, there's, I don't know if the committee has to give its, its a point or its recommendation or not. There's some stuff that I'm looking more detail on. I, I mean, I think June is the expected period where this is meant to supposedly tail off. Um, so, I mean, some of these parts would be normally seen to be uh, excessive in any other period are obviously required for this period so I'm just unsure whether they're all required for more than two years or even more than six months so from from my perspective I'm looking some more information on that so I don't know if I can um, give full carte blanche support to everything in, in the bill but you know there's stuff in it that is essential for public health. I think, sure, what we have to be careful about. Um, I mean, I don't see anything in the regulations here that I find difficulty with. In fact, there's maybe things that we would want to be added to it rather than taken away from it. <coughs> uh, I'm reassured by the indications that there will be six monthly reviews. But I think also we have to be, it, it is, uh, we're getting into a period of uncertainty. Uh, we are hearing people telling us that we'll be over the the, the hump, as it were, by June and, and back to normal, and that'll be tremendously be great news if that's the case. But equally as well, since we are in this unknown period, there's every possibility that there could be a surge, and then in July or August or September there could be another surge. We don't know. We're looking at what's happening in China, uh, and maybe even reassured by the fact that it appears to be dampening down there. Um, but we don't know. It could it could just reappear again, and we could be back where we're sitting today. We could be back in August or September, sitting in exactly the same place. So, I it is that they are extreme powers, and as Jerry says, in normal circumstances we'd be a bit concerned about more than a bit concerned. But I think, given the circumstances, um, I think it's responsible what the government's doing. And I think the fact that they are putting a, a two-year limit on it, I think, again, that's just been prudent. Um, and you don't want this legislation to be running out on the 1st of August or something like that, and then fine, that you have to come back to the drawing board again and, and resurrect it all. So I think it's, it's prudent, but I think reviews are necessary, and this, the six-month review, is, I think, would, would give us all a little bit of reassurance. Absolutely. Alex? 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for the difficult times we have ahead and the unprecedented times and the unpredictability of what we're dealing with. Um, I think as a committee, we do have to support this. I don't think we have any alternative. I think we would be playing people's lives if we don't support it. Um, and I believe we have to use every tool in the book to try and protect our people, protect lives, give the authorities the tools they need to work with and our health staff and ourselves. Um, because, like Alan said, we don't know what's going to happen in two months' time. It could be worse, it could be slightly better. Um, and we need to give everybody the equipment, the tools and the powers to deal with us as best they can. Yeah, I certainly would be in agreement with that from a party point of view. I think this is absolutely not the time for politicking. It's, it's the time um, for acting, and acting for the greater good and for the public health of <coughs> all of our community. Uh, I know Colin wants back in. Yeah, just, just to say that the application of these powers must be used to protect people at all costs. Frontline staff, vulnerable people in our community, and people who are struggling in any way, and that's that's how these are being carried. Yeah, I would be in uh, full agreement with the chair there. So I don't know, members, do you wish to come to a view? I certainly know from a personal point of view, I would like to for the committee to take an actual view, but uh, the committee doesn't have to take a view. But I certainly would like them to. Oh, well, I think sure we emphasize the, the, the review. Uh, I think that, that's a protection. Um, but I think as a committee, we'll have to, we'll have to support all that's in it. Uh, but just that the, the committee would certainly like to, to see the sixth month review even part and parcel of it all. Do you need a proposal? Do we, do we need a proposal? Uh, can, are, are, are we in agreement? I mean, I, I, like I said, I, I'm in general agreement, but there's some stuff that I, you know, as a party, we might sort of suggest be amended. So with that in mind, um, I don't know if I can say we agreed it, but also there's, there's some tweaks which I think need to be made, but generally speaking, okay. I think there's powers which I think are, are important because of the, the situation we're in, so just to lay my perspective and position on it. Okay. okay. So, um, can I just um, put the question formally, and that's the, that the Health Committee, or the Committee for Health, has considered the legislative consent memorandum in relation to the coronavirus bill and supports the extension of the relevant health provisions to this jurisdiction. Agreed. I'm asking, are you agreed? Can we add on the, the six month review that we, or is that? I think if it's already, that? no, we can't. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think this was in the form of an amendment that um, cross parties went to the government with in advance of this. So it hasn't been agreed per se, but I think behind... Well, could we not indicate that we would support that even in, in the word no? We're not necessarily insisting on it, but we would support a six-month review. We'll just take advice from the clerk here. So the legislative consent motion before the Assembly is subject to very strict rules about what amendments can be put down right. in relation to that. Um, uh, you can get advice from the business clerks in relation to that, and of course there's an opportunity for members to speak fully tomorrow during the debate and outline and air those issues. But for the moment, as I understand it, this committee has asked, does it support the extension of those provisions to this jurisdiction? And that's the, the yes or no can question it not be for me. Can it not be put on as a caveat that the committee would welcome? We're not asking for it specifically to be an amendment or incorporated in the wording of the legislation, but the view of the committee is that they would welcome six monthly reviews. It's just given an indication of what the, the mood and the feeling of the, the committee would, would be, and it's just a safeguard. That can be reflected in the speech yeah. from the yeah. deputy chair tomorrow yeah. during the debate. Happy enough for that. Okay. So can I ask then if we have agreement? Yes. Yep. Agreed. Thank you. And... Um, are members content that I represent the range of views uh, and the issues raised, but um, and that uh, state that that the committee um, is in support of the Great. LCM? Okay, thank you. Okay, members, then do we have any other business? Alex, tomorrow's debate is it just like a general debate? It's not close by close room, actually. 
We'll just be it, yeah. uh, it's a debate on whether or not the Assembly supports okay. the extension of those powers to Northern Ireland okay. on a yes or no basis. Okay. Mine's not related to tomorrow's business. It's more around um, any indication about what the agenda for Thursday will be um, regarding PPA and testing. I think we'd agreed on Thursday that we were going to try and get departmental officials along. So I'm just wondering, is there any update on Thursday's agenda? So. Um, I'm expecting, I haven't got names yet, but I'm expecting officials from the department to brief on the surge plan overall, including a particular focus on testing and kit, as indicated by members. Okay. And we've also furthered the committee's um, decisions last week. We've advised the department of the issues raised in relation to community pharmacy and social care uh, in case those should arise. Thank you. Um, sure, I'm getting, I'm sure, like the rest of the committee, we're, I, I've been getting a lot of indications from pleas from uh, frontline uh, nurses uh, from the police as well about this uh, lack of equipment and we keep hearing that there there is equipment available but there, there definitely there are people falling through the crack that don't appear to be getting um, supply of the of the equipment maybe for somebody in authority it feels that you know there, again it's all about timing that the, with, I'm sure they don't have mountains and mountains of the equipment. They have to anticipate that they may not be getting replacement uh, equipment, and they have to be sure that it lasts. So maybe they are been a bit, you know, holding back. Just that again, just every day that the, the buy is another day of supply they have left. But just as I say, I have been getting a lot of of heartfelt pleas from, particularly from nursing staff, frontline nursing staff, that they feel that. It's, uh, there is some form of protection being provided, but they don't feel adequate or they're not reassured by, by what they're, they're having. So. And it's a, it's a genuine concern, and we're all inundated with those requests for PPE, and I, I suppose we, we have to have a bit of faith in the department that, that, that they are managing this as best they can. I suppose what we can do from, from this point of view is make it maybe a public plea out there to industry, if anybody can, uh, you know, rework the issue and, and, and if they think they could provide it to come forward to the department and, and offer that, that I think service. The big problem it, you know, is that we've made the world has become reliant on China for an awful lot of uh, logistics, you know, like you know, plastic bottles and glass, uh, glass bottles and bottles for sanitizers. It's not the lack of sanitizer, it's the lack of bottles to put them in. So I think that that's a big big issue just yeah, certainly a big issue but we can we can return to that issue then at the at the next meeting okay so um call you any further comment before we finish up okay thank you so members um the time date and place of next meeting the meeting will take place at 10 30 a.m on thursday 26th of march in room 30. Thank you all. So just the rooms to be confirmed. And the rooms to be confirmed. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.